Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you are on the West Coast. Welcome to our webinar on modern finance and the mission of the church. Uh, we're delighted that you're with us. Uh, this uh, webinar is brought to you by the Oikonomia Network. Uh, my name is Greg Forster. I'm the director of the Oikonomia Network, and uh, we're so happy that you're with us. Uh, we are a community of theological educators dedicated to connecting uh, theological scholarship and education to the way people actually live, to fruitful work and vocation, and to economic wisdom and uh, working for the common good uh, in, uh, in society. So thanks for being here. Quick, couple of quick reminders. Uh, please mute your Zoom uh, when uh, you aren't speaking so that we don't have uh, background noise uh, uh, interfering. And uh, as always in our webinars, if you would uh, please post your questions in the chat box. Uh, we definitely want to hear from you. And uh, there's no need to wait. Uh, when you have a question to ask, you can just enter it uh, and uh, our uh, our discussion moderator will find it there when, when we open up for questions. So please feel free to fire ahead. Uh, and a big thank you to uh, members of Karam Fellowship. Uh, we rely entirely on your support to do the work that we do. So we're grateful as always uh, for your support. If uh, you aren't a member of Karam Fellowship, I'm putting a link in the chat. You can check us out, find out what we're all about uh, and, uh, and, and uh, join Karam Fellowship today if you're so inclined. Uh, I'm now going to uh, get out of the way and pass it on to our, uh, our guests, whom we're very grateful to for, for joining us. Uh, on this uh, subject of finance and human flourishing, uh, we have, uh, first of all, Jason Meyer, who joins us from the Eventide Center for Faith and Investing, uh, Mary Neighbor, who is with Sage Stone Wealth Management, and Shane Enet, for, uh, finance professor at Biola University. Uh, and to moderate and uh, facilitate and lead this discussion, a uh, man who is uh, well-known and well-beloved in our community for a very long time, Scott Ray, uh, Professor of Philosophy and Christian Ethics at the Talbot School of Theology. So, uh, Scott, please take it away. Well, thank you, Greg, and welcome to all of you. It's good to have you with us for this, what we think is a pretty important conversation uh, on the area of Christian faith and finance. You, you recall, out of our theology of work, that we have been working on for, for over a decade now. Uh, we, we not only affirm the nobility of work, but uh, in terms of Paul's statement in Colossians 3, that, it, that in whatever you do in your work, it's the Lord Christ whom you are serving. And as a result of that, we hold the notion that all believers are in full-time ministry or full-time service. Uh, and as we regularly tell our, our business students, Shane, you'll, you'll be aware of this from, from our work together in the business school at Biola, uh, we regularly say accounting is full-time ministry. Uh, marketing is full-time ministry. Uh, management is full-time ministry. And finance is full-time ministry. Full-time service to the king. Uh, and we, we, we do that for all, you know, all arenas of the workplace uh, that, const that they constitute full-time service. What we don't often do, however, is to spell out in more detail exactly what we mean by the notion that accounting, finance, marketing, man, all these things constitute full-time ministry. And our students, I think, are left with the, this open question, well, how, is, how exactly is that so? I think this is especially important for the theological educators who are working with the next generation of pastors and church leaders to be able to spell out and tease out in a little bit more detail how the various parts of their work particularly in this area of finance, constitute full-time service to Jesus? What is the connection between finance and individuals and communities flourishing? Uh, how do they constitute ministry? So this is what we've asked our panel to address. Uh, delighted to have each of our panel members with us. They've thought a lot about this subject already. Uh, and so to, to, I know to ask them to to put it in just five minutes, which is the amount of time we're giving each of them before we open it up for questions for all of you, is a tall order. So uh, I would ask all of our panelists to put this in cut to the chase mode uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and we'll have time for nuancing and, and other things to come out in the question and answer period. So uh, Jason, let it, let's start with you. Uh, I recognize some faces in our audience today, others, others I don't. 
but our, our audience on, in the Quran Fellowship is overwhelmingly a theological educators uh, audience, uh, not particularly finance trained. Uh, I mean, I majored in economics in college, uh, but when I got to seminary, uh, I, I knew nothing about the kind of the kind of financial markets and management that uh, is required today. Uh, so most of our folks are not finance trained. Finance, I think, to them can seem somewhat overwhelming and maybe even a bit intimidating with the focus on numbers, formulas, algorithms, all of that. So you get, Jason, you get the task of introducing our, our group to sort of a, a quick and uh, easy, hopefully easy view of finance 101. Uh, what do they need to know about the world of finance to enter this discussion well? Great. Uh, well, it's uh, yeah, great to be with everyone and to spend time with such a distinguished audience. I am a visual person, and I think visuals are helpful in answering my task here. So uh, I like to ask people what they see in their mind when they think about it, modern finance or investing today. I think for a lot of us, it can look like this. Reports with exotic metrics like alpha, beta, R squared, Sharpe ratio, Sortino ratio, et cetera. We see streaming ticker symbols. We think about talking heads on some news program reporting on the latest breaking news in the market, charts with zigzagging lines, Wall Street and its traders shouting orders over the den of the stock exchanges. I call all of these images the financial machinery of investing that really surrounds investing today. And we look at this stuff and we think we need to uh, <clears throat> advance training in, in finance in order to make sense of it, let alone bring our faith into the picture. But the good news is that if we can get behind all of this financial machinery, investing is actually something very ordinary and transparent and easy to understand. In fact, when we see investing clearly, we can clearly see, I think, how our faith begins to make connections. Lots of areas of our brain will start lighting up. So let me share with you <clears throat> what I think that is. I think that at its most basic level, investing involves a supply of capital to support business in exchange for the rights to receive profits and growth. It really is this simple. Now, of course, we're not investing in buildings. When we think of a business, this is a management team, and relationships with customers, employees, suppliers, communities, the environment, and wider society. This is what investing is today. Now, there is complexity because although this is at the bottom of it, we can often not invest in companies directly, but rather buy securities on the stock exchanges or secondary markets. Uh, many of us don't pick those securities. We're investing in funds where we've hired a fund manager to pick these securities for us. Some of us work with financial advisors who pick the funds that then pick the securities. And many financial advisors today are increasingly using uh, what's called model allocations where the funds they're choosing are actually chosen by another group. And so there's a lot of different parties at play here, but none of this stuff changes the fundamental relationship to investing, which is this. Now, I want to say a word on our topic about how the stuff of business and the stuff of investing actually contributes to the flourishing of the world, God's world. So let me share a couple of thoughts and we can continue it in the conversation subsequently. Um, I like a statement that comes from Jeff Van Duzer, who was at Seattle Pacific University uh, in his book, Why Business Matters to God. He says, God's mission state for business could be put this way. Number one, to provide a community with goods and services to enable it to flourish and to provide opportunities for meaningful work that will allow employees to express their God-given creativity. This is a, a little bit of the same. He says, one goal is focused outward, providing goods and services that enhance the quality of life. One goal focuses inward, creating opportunities for individuals within the company to express their vocation and performance of God-glorifying work. There are others who agree. I'll share one more quote with you. This is from Craig Bartholomew, the Kirby Lang Center for Public Theology in the UK. He says, the first question is, what is the creational design or characteristic responsibility of business? Business is to love one's neighbor by providing goods and services in a just and stewardly manner. So we see that external purpose, 
goods and services, as well as that internal purpose, make them in a just and stewardly way as you interact in this human community and with creation. Uh, what about the profit piece? <laughs> Uh, well, we shouldn't denigrate the profit piece. I like this quote from, uh, this is Bonnie Wurzbacher, who was a former executive at Coca-Cola and World Vision. She says, as the sole source of wealth creation in the world, business enables every other social, civic, and even spiritual institution to exist. Uh, in economic terms, we would say that all other institutions are funded by wealth that was first created by business. Business, therefore, uh, provides the material foundation that undergirds human flourishing and uniquely demonstrates God's attribute of provision for creation. One final word, where does the investing fit in? Well, investing supplies the capital that enables and enlarges the work of business. Here's how I like to think about investing after having done it now for about 13 years. Investors, I see them as master planners over the work that is done in the garden of God, the whole of creation. We are to look out over that garden of God at all of the various kinds of business work taking place and make strategic capital allocation decisions with the purpose of enlarging the beauty and goodness of God's creation for the flourishing of all and for his honor and glory. So I will pass it back over to you, Scott. All right, Jason, thank you very much and for sticking to within your time limit, I especially appreciate. Uh, there, I think there are a couple things we'll tease out in the questions, but thank you for that big, that 35,000 foot view of where finance fits into the general, uh, the, the general utility of business uh, for individuals and communities flourishing. Mary, let's turn to you. Uh, you deal with individual clients primarily, um, and you have individual clients that I suspect have a lot, they come to you looking at this primarily out of their own self-interest. Uh, how do I, you know, how do I make sure I've got a comfortable retirement? How do I make sure I'm gonna get a good return on, my, on, my, on, on the money that you manage for me? Um, but your view of investing has a, uh, is much broader than that. Uh, you have a, a vision and goals that are, that are broader than that. How do you begin to talk to clients about broadening their vision for what they can do with their investing or what they can avoid doing with their investing uh, going forward. I think this, this is specific. I think it really can be a tough conversation to open about that connection between their investments and the flourishing of their community. So how do you go about that with your clients? Sure, thank you for the invitation to be here. So I begin with the same question that Jason uh, started with. I generally ask someone, so have you ever heard about ethical investing? And about 95% of the time, the answer is no, but the word ethical, it's a word that is novel. It's intriguing, it resonates. And I'm usually asked to explain what I mean. And even if I'm not, I still do. So ethical investing uh, started with the Quakers, uh, at least in this country, who by moral economic choices decided not to profit from weapons in the slave trade due to convictions of their Christian faith. Since that time, ethical investing in our country has also been referred to as socially responsible investing or social investing in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, today, it's called ESG in, in uh, traditional financial, the traditional financial world. In the Wall Street Journal, you'll see ESG, an acronym for environmental social governance. In the Christian community, we've referred to it for the last two decades as values-based investing, morally responsible investing, biblical, <laughs> biblically responsible investing, and as of recent, faith-driven investing. So if you've heard any of those names, that's what we're talking about. Ethical investing is the thoughtful consideration of faith and ethics in our personal investment decisions. And, uh, and so traditionally, it's broken down into three facets. Uh, the first facet, the most widely practiced facet is that of portfolio screening. So if you were to look at a portfolio, if your own portfolio of individual stocks, whether it's at Schwab or TD Ameritrade, you look at your individual stocks and look to see, are there companies that I am a co-owner of that are profiting in ways that um, hurt my neighbor, harm my neighbor, appeal to their weaknesses and addictions, lead them to sin? 
So some of those companies in the Christian community have been companies profiting from abortion, pornography, tobacco, gambling. And so it's easy to look at a portfolio and see yourself as a co-owner and say, you know, even if you have to look online and look at the profile and, you know, finance, Yahoo Finance, look and see, do I resonate? Am I comfortably being a co-owner? Because when we're co-owners, we are producing, we are producing, in this case, let's say pornography, producing, promoting, and profiting. And I know this talk is about flourishing of communities. Number one, we don't want to profit at the expense of our neighbor, at the opposite, which is death and uh, the opposite of flourishing. <clears throat> so look at your individual por you know, stock portfolio. Let's say you have a 403B, these academics here. So you want to take a look at your <laughs> portfolio and look to see if you are invested in the traditional investment funds on Wall Street, because a lot of those investment funds, as Jason noted, uh, don't take into consideration ethical Christian ethics and are comfortable profiting in companies, profiting from all sorts of uh, sin in the world. So there are a number in the last two decades of investment funds managed by people of strong Christian faith. A few names are cross, um, cross Mark Steward funds, even Tied Timothy Plan, Ave Maria. And a lot of these funds have been a four and five star um, received four and five star ratings on Morningstar. They have been incredible performers and funds that um, are run in a way that considers our Christian values and Christian faith. So uh, I definitely would advise taking a look at your 403B. And if those funds are there or aren't there, it's worth asking your HR rep to provide those funds or give you access to funds that give you those options. So that's portfolio screening. We think it's one of the most important things you can do. Again, Hippocrates said, uh, or at least he's credited with saying, first do no harm. And one of my favorite verses, Romans 13, we know that scripture, right? The first uh, 10 commandments, apostle Paul, are a lot of thou shalt not. Uh, in Romans 13, Paul says, the commandments are all summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. He goes on to say, love does no harm to a neighbor. So love does no harm to a neighbor. And I know this is a Wesley crowd. So I want to quote his sermon, The Use of Money in 1789. He said, the first of these in the use of money is gain all you can. But this it is certain we ought not to do. We ought not to gain money at the expense of life. Therefore, we may not engage or continue in any sinful trade. We are thirdly to gain all we can without hurting our neighbor. Remember, love does no harm to its neighbor. We cannot, if we love everyone as, our, sir, as ourselves, hurt anyone in his substance. Those who have anything to do with taverns, uh, ventilating houses, if they are either sinful in themselves or natural inlet to sin of various kinds, then it is to be feared. You have a sad account to make. And that is from 1789. <laughs> so I'll just touch on two other facets of ethical investing. The second is shareholder engagement. So if you, again, are an owner of individual companies, you'll receive a proxy in your email and to give you the that allows you the opportunity to vote on issues of corporate concern and in effect uh, influence corporate culture to pay more attention to conditions in third world factories to consider environmental impact, the environmental impacts of, of their operations uh, to rein in maybe some excessive executive compensation. So if you can either do that in individual stocks and some of these faith-based, faith-driven funds I've talked about will actually vote your proxies on your behalf of Christian uh, ethical considerations. The third facet is considered impact investing or proactive investing. It is, in addition to just doing no harm, let's go do as much good as we can. And so there are a number of ways we can uh, do that in our personal investments. So some of, some of us you know, may use Chase or Bank of America. You can shift your cash savings and checking to um, a credit union. Uh, or community bank that is intentionally investing in underserved communities with loans for starting businesses. Some of those include Evangelical Community um, Bank in Los Angeles. There is the Evangelical Christian Credit Union now called Adelphi that loan, provides loans to ministries. And so a great way to not just take even your cash savings and put it towards kingdom work, 
but you will often find that a lot of these credit unions are providing a higher rate of return from that 0.01 to maybe even a 0 .0, 0.10, 10 basis points, a 10 times return over your you know, traditional bank. Uh, other forms of impact investing include investing in films or art, private placements, uh, real estate regeneration, business uh, buildings, uh, residential buildings that are also furthering the kingdom of God, whether they are places of ministry or serving the kingdom in other ways, and social venture capital for accredited investors, and then just general proactive screening, looking for publicly traded companies that are furthering humans flourishing. Um, I'll just conclude by noting that after I talk about these different ways of <clears throat> shifting capital from investment of the world into kingdom work, uh, the way I like to say, broaden the perspective of those I am privileged to meet or work with. I like to look at scripture. I mean, what's interesting is that the ESG movement, and I have a quote from Bloomberg Intelligence, that ESG, that's, sorry, the secular practice of what we're talking about, is on track to exceed 50 trillion by 2025, representing more than a third of the projected 140.5 trillion in total global, global assets. ESG assets surpassed 35 trillion in 2020. These numbers are mind blowing. These are not often people who uh, are investing in a way that they perceive helps their neighbor by virtue of their Christian faith. I don't know if one out of three Christians that we know are investing this way, but one out of three investor dollars in the world is being invested this way. But we as believers have the word of God. Um, and Jesus himself gives us a parable of the master and the servant, the steward. He says that the steward is accountable to the master for how the wealth that he's been entrusted to has been managed. Um, you know, Jesus himself said straight up in Luke, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? He doesn't say, so if you have not been trustworthy in tithing 10%, he says, if you have not been trustworthy in handling 100% of what I've entrusted to you, who will trust you with true riches? And it, it means that there's eternal significance. These opportunities to transition our capital or even our little, you know, our investment funds in our 403B to faith-driven funds, uh, companies that aren't profiting in ways that make us uncomfortable. Uh, that is an act of stewardship. It's an act of honoring and glorifying God. It has significance immediately today in the way we're able to love our neighbor, even neighbors we may never meet through our investment and in the moral economic choices we're making personally in our own 403B or 401Ks or our own IRAs. We're loving our neighbor tangibly today. We're loving God today. And he says we have uh, the opportunity to um, handle perhaps, you know, eternal treasures, true treasures tomorrow. Right. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for your perspective on that. Shane, let me turn to you. Uh, how do you connect finance and investing to the mission of the kingdom? Uh, yeah. I, and I'm specifically interested in how you, how you envision finance serving tr traditionally underserved communities and yeah. contributes to their flourishing. So finance, you know, as Jason mentions, is this beautiful picture of uh, people who have money contributing to people who have great ideas. Uh, for products and services that enable human flourishing. And the practice of finance is this uh, process of developing tools and structures and products uh, that help uh, match people. And so if you can imagine someone, uh, it, there is a story of a, a young boy in, um, in Nigeria who had just a cell phone and late at night, uh, he wanted to help solve a problem where people didn't have enough water to, to have for hygiene, for washing their hands. And so he actually spent a month uh, learning the uh, chemistry and chemical processes. And he developed a product that allowed people to completely be hygienic with um, chemical, uh, you know, kind of a gel that didn't require water. And he did this all late at night on his little cell phone learning this. Uh, and so he has this great product idea that would serve his community well. Uh, but in order for that to go out into the community, it needs, it requires capital, it requires money. Uh, and finance really is this neat endeavor where how do we match 
how do we match people who have these incredible ideas, who have this incredible passion for serving uh, with the people who have the money? And so uh, finance in the beginning has always been conceived as a, as a bank, you know, where uh, everyone kind of puts their money into the bank. The bank, uh, you know, gives a certain amount of interest for access to that capital and then is the gatekeeper that then sends the money out into the community. But unfortunately, a traditional banking model creates a huge swath of underserved people in the community just because there's a limited amount of gatekeepers and there's limited access to those gatekeepers. And I think there's just been this neat movement that we've seen in culture really brought on by technology that has allowed uh, the, the access to capital grow and grow and grow. Um, you know, and there's been inventions that have really pushed things forward. Uh, I'd say the invention of the Limited Liability Corporation which allows for banks and other businesses to be owned by normal shareholders, that really spurred on a quickening of access of, to capital for the common person, allowed for you know, all, the, all of our modern technologies to occur. Um, you, know, you invent something in the garage, then all of a sudden you can get a billion dollars from millions of different people. That, that was a, a finance invention, which is cool. And, uh, you know, and then there's inventions of ETFs and mutual funds and you know, the mortgage was a finance invention that allowed uh, for people to have greater access to, uh, to money to buy home. Um, you know, and recently, uh, within the last couple of decades, micro lending has been an invention to, to have bank services go out to more underserved communities. I'd say some of the more exciting finance inventions that are occurring that will create a quickening of access between people who have money and people who have ideas it are things like you know this crowdfunding that's occurring. Um, donor advice funds are just an incredible invention where people are contributing capital as a charitable deduction, and then it's going into a pool of money. You know, and people like Sovereign Capital uh, are able to then invest it in redemptive businesses uh, straight into the community. You know, and then there's uh, crowdfunding for um, for entertainment, you know, like uh, Angel Studios, if anyone here is a big fan of The Chosen, I'm a huge fan, you know, they, they you know, I contribute and help produce entertainment, um, which is a really fun way of investing. But I'd say the biggest new finance invention that's going to really even quicken the access to um, capital so that then more products and services are, are created um, quickly is, uh, is blockchain technology and how uh, that really creates this ability to cut out. So, so Jason, you saw all those different middlemen people uh, and really blockchain allows for a secure way of transacting um, that would allow for greater and greater access. I think in many ways right now, the way blockchain is being used is endorsing a, you know, a, a gambling spirit and um, you know, a, a bit of a, it's all about entertainment, but the technology itself, I think, is going to revolutionize uh, financial technology, which then creates more access, which then creates more ac um, service to all community and not just those who know the right people. So I'll leave it at that and let us uh, address questions. All right, Shane, thank you. Those are some innovations that I suspect not, not all of us were aware of. Uh, and it's exciting to see some of the ways in which those are being used today. Uh, let me remind you, put your questions in the chat box and I'll moderate those. Brett, uh, we'll, let you, we'll let you have the first question here. What do, you, what do you perceive to be the greatest threat to justice or the common good in our modern economy? So we'll let each of you take a quick stab at that if you wish. Um, and we have to keep, uh, keep our answers brief here because we're getting a little short on time. Yeah, maybe I'll uh, chime in here. So, <clears throat> excuse me. From my slides, you remember I was adding piece by piece and I was stretching out that distance that exists between investors and the companies that we're investing in and the impacts those companies are having in the lives of, of others and in wider society. I think that uh, one of the biggest challenges to investing serving the common good is just as that chain gets stretched longer and longer and longer, the feeling of the connection of of investing to business and to impacting the lives of others gets stretched really to a breaking point. And what's left is just the numbers. Um, I, I wanna, I'll share with, with you a quote on this point. I was in a, 
the Morningstar Conference, which is one of the largest investing conferences in the world. This was a few years ago. It was a plenary session. I was listening to a very famous fund manager, a person named Cliff Asnes, uh, who went to the Chicago School of Economics, very well-respected figure, brilliant. And he was talking about his investment process up on the stage. And I, I, just, can't, I just remember so vividly what he said as he was describing his process. He said, I pride myself on not knowing what's in our portfolios. So if you think about this for a minute, his, his job is to pick the companies for the portfolios. And he's saying that he considers it a point of pride to not know the names of the companies that he's choosing. Now, why would this be? He's a quantitative investor. He's a numbers guy. He does factor investing. And he's, he's boasting because his process is so disciplined around that, that he actually will remove the names of the companies from the numbers before he sees the numbers so that he doesn't look at the numbers and have a mental association. Oh, this is Amazon. This is Google. He wants to make purely rational decisions on the basis of those numbers. I remember looking around the room just to see how his comment registered on the faces of the audience. And there was great admiration. And on the one hand, I think we can admire that level of discipline in one's process, but haven't we lost something really important when we've completely removed the loathsome corporeal business stuff of investing and just made it this kind of math problem to solve for the purpose of maximizing returns. And so I really do think, I know this is maybe a dodge on the question, but I do think the biggest challenge to uh, serving the common good through, through modern finance is if we sever the connection to human beings and treat finance as just solving a big equation where all the decisions are come down to essentially how do we maximize risk-adjusted returns rather than engaging in that real human discernment about what is good for the world and what is fitting with the beauty and goodness of creation. Great, thanks, Jason. Any, uh, Mary, Shane, you wanna weigh in on that? Uh, the word that came to mind was uh, Christian ignorance. This just came to mind. So what do I mean by that? Uh, I can certainly say I was not incredibly familiar with the financial markets until I got to college. So high school let us down. None of us got a financial course and some of us did end up in that field, but I think uh, it's pretty conclusive in scripture that God says we all have uh, a responsibility in accounting, which means we must all have capacity to move beyond the numbers and look at really what are we capitalizing? What are we participating in as co-owners. It's actually, I have found the act of looking at one's financial portfolio on our client's behalf, for example, or friends, is that by taking what we know and is true to our own hearts, uh, our love for, for God and our love for our neighbor, that we're taking something that we already are very confident in. And it's a bridge. It's a bridge. Now, the this uh you know, stock has meaning and significance because I'm looking at it from the eyes of the love of God and the love of my neighbor. And, and so, so we can use our ethical screening or ethical perspective as a bridge into this world. And um, I say that because, you know what, the ESG movement is absolutely on the move. Like I said, it's expected to make up a third of uh, investor dollars. So it is helping our common good in modern economy. Uh, the secular world is doing that. I think if we're doing it apart from God, apart from honoring him, what is the eternal significance? What does that mean to God? I mean, he truly desires for all of us in the global economy to love our neighbor, but uh, it's, he's honored when we're doing it from, you know, from a love and relationship with mm -hmm. him. I'll just throw one other uh, example in there, shareholder action. So I, uh, one of the crown jewel examples, and even Tide speaks to this, is, uh, and it's very common in SRI history to hear about the South African apartheid movement and how in the 70s, a number of uh, social investors led by some uh, religious organizations pressured companies like General Motors, Coca-Cola, Dow Chemical to withdraw operations from South Africa in response to, uh, in, in objection to the apartheid state. And it was somewhere there in the, I think, early 90s where there was a transition away from that, you know, to the ruling of Mandela, away from the apartheid state. Um, 
And there is a perspective that social investing or the allocation of capital had this incredible tr- impact on uh, the, the political state. So, I mean, I, I kind of currently view the crisis in Ukraine and the decision of the global economy to completely withdraw capital from Russia as a bit of an experiment. I hope it you know, can have a significant impact, um, but we're in the midst of seeing how that's gonna work out with you know, global sanctions a- against the 11th largest economy. Um, that mm-hmm. is the practice of capital either supporting organizations that we you know, are in agreement with or uh, taking action even at cost to not align ourselves with, with uh, those activities. Okay, good. Shane, let me phrase the question a little differently for you. Yeah. Um, one, I think one of the glaring uh, failures of the financial system was the 2008 financial crash. Yeah, where, that's where I was going with this question. Yeah, okay, well then, yeah, finance going off the rails. So tell, yeah. tell give us your take on that. In, and I know yeah. you got to be quick about this because we're, yeah. this is a whole book subject. So yeah, so Brett, I, I think um, finance, uh, it's like, you know, can be a kid in a candy store. They create a new thing and then they think it's amazing. They don't really actually understand it. And so there's a learning curve. And so, uh, you know, when when mortgages were first invented, it was awesome, amazing, but then it went too far. So in 08, they just started giving out to anyone um, and the banks just kind of like, you know, then they created this securitization and they created securitization of securitization, these kind of crazy structures, um, you know, where it was too complicated. They thought they could solve things with math. And then I think the same exact thing is happening with blockchain where you, you have this new toy and it's a democratization of money, which is incredible. Uh, and it creates this unleashing of capital going all over the place. And that's it. It creates this incredible systemic problem because systemic risk, which is the risk of the whole system, it increases as people are using this in such a broad, ubiquitous way, and they don't understand it. Uh, you just, you know, if you ever watch the movie Margin Call, it's a very clear picture of the pe- no one understood what they were doing, and then all of a sudden, one analyst realized that this whole system is going to just explode, and that was what would happen in 08. And then, uh, you know, that, and there's just The Big Short is another movie that kind of featured this, and I think the same thing is going to happen with blockchain where people are just using this because it's this new toy. It's so exciting. And, and, and there's a lot of good flourishing that occurs, but there's a loss of also a lot of danger um, when it's so widely adopted without necessarily perceiving the risks involved. Appreciate that. J- Jason, let me uh, follow up uh, a little bit with you on the um, question that you had. Um, and that is, you know, how do you assess things like day trading, short selling uh, within your model that look to the average person more like gambling than investing and sort of treat the markets like a casino rather than a place where capital is distributed. Can you speak to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that is something that I'm personally philosophically very, well, not warm to. Uh, I think investing should be something durable. I, I think um, there are, of course, instances in investing where, you know, uh, in 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 our investment practice at Eventide, let's say it's a biotech company, and you invest with the hope that that uh, this treatment is going to get FDA approval, and then shortly after investing, something happens. Uh, it comes out that there was a clinical trial failure and then all of a sudden the investment is over. And so you've owned it only for a short period of time. It can also go the other way where you get in and then quickly the, the price moves up and you hit your price target. And so there's a, there's a time to sell. But I think it's a different posture when you're investing for a specific goal that is going to happen with that business over time versus where the goal is really just just a short-term price movement in the market. I think when, it, when, when our vision is pegged on price movements rather than on real intrinsic and productive activity taking place at the business, we have more of that gambling mindset than we do the investing mindset. I see, that's helpful. Uh, Luke has a question too. Luke, thanks for, for coming in. I'm glad you came in when you did. 
uh, and your question, I think I'm going to give this to Mary because I know she's got a resource that's that she wants to make available to you. Some of, Luke wants to know some of the best uh, textbook quality books. My Mary, you've got an article that came out on Christianity Today some time ago uh, that you want to give us access to. Uh, but what if you had to recommend me one book on on faith based finance? Uh, in addition, first tell us about your article and then about the book that you recommend. Uh, so in 2001, so 20 years ago, I wrote the first feature article in Christianity Today on ethical investing. Uh, it was their most popular article as measured by demand for reprints, uh, 20,000 in several years. And uh, it, it's interesting because the article itself talks about the practices we're discussing that are, you know, continuing to grow in the faith-driven investor movement today. It, so um, because I'm the, I was the author, I have the copyright, so I certainly would love to pass that along to you at seven pages. And so you can either, you can look, seek us out at info at sagestonewealth.com and we can send you the PDF. I'll send it along to Scott too, if you want to ask him go. to forward it. Yeah, um, thank you, you. Thank you, Greg. That email address is in the chat box. So Right. Yes, absolutely. That's Please great. reach out to us and we can forward you that article. And um, I know that it's been anyway useful. I would say a great resource in terms of how the movement has grown has been uh, a nonprofit called Faith Driven Investor, faithdriveninvestor.org. Uh, and they have a number of resources, a number of podcasts and lectures, speeches, uh, talks on uh, how the Faith Driven Investor movement has really been advancing uh, and so that would be another great resource Good. I would recommend. Good. Shane, Jason, any any la last word on resources that you'd recommend to our folks? Yeah. Point to, point to eventide. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to put a plug in. So uh, in December, uh, eventide launched the eventide center for faith and investing, which is uh, an online home uh, for this, this type of education. So it's not in a traditional book format. But there's a journal of some really terrific articles there written by what I consider to be some of the bright lights in and around the faith and investing movement. There's a podcast. There will be courses available coming soon. So that's a free resource for you to check out. Um, we haven't had, I would say, the definitive book written on, on faithful investing yet. There's, a, there's been a number of takes on it that offer, I think, good insight on little facets of it. But it's not in a book form yet, but I, I think there are some really good resources available online. Sounds like something's coming out soon. Uh, <laughs> I, no, don't, I don't have plans on it yet, but uh, hopefully someone someone does it soon. Well, that's great. And Greg, thank you for putting into the chat box the bo both the e the email the email address for uh, for Mary's organization and for the faithandinvesting.com, which is the Eventide site. So thank you to oh, all sorry. our panelists. Yeah. Yes, go sorry, for it's it. Faith faithdriveninvestor.org, I'm pretty sure, but you can Google it too. Okay, faithdriveninvestor.org. Okay, very good. All right, I want to say thank you to our panelists. I'm going to turn it back to Greg here to close us out for the, for the day. Thank you, Scott. And uh, since we're sharing resources, I'm going to re-put into the chat uh, the Karam Fellowship link. Uh, so you can check that out uh, because we rely on your support and we're very grateful for it. Thanks for being with us. Uh, this is our last webinar of the semester. So uh, thanks to everyone who has joined us uh, over the course of the semester. We do have webinars every semester. So uh, subscribe to our newsletter and that's free. Uh, you can go to oikonomianetwork.org, uh, which is linked from where I've, uh, where I've just given you the link. Uh, and you can sign up for our free newsletter and that'll give you uh, updates as we roll out our fall, uh, uh, our fall webinars. We also have an annual event Karam Forum happens every November. We will be in Denver, Denver, Colorado this November 17 to 18, but you can also join the event by Zoom uh, if you're so inclined. Uh, and we have a lot of people who join both ways. So uh, those are some future opportunities and uh, thanks for being with us uh, for this very fruitful and insightful con uh, conversation. We're gonna continue to uh, uh, steward conversations about these big issues of uh, how we serve human flourishing. Uh, so thanks for being with us and we hope to see you soon.